Our scripture today is from 1 Timothy, the first chapter, verses 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength because he considered me faithful. So he appointed me to the ministry, even though I used to speak against him, attack his people, and I was proud, but I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and without faith. Our Lord's favor poured all over me, along with the faithfulness and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is reliable and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the biggest sinner of all. But this is why I was shown mercy, so that Christ Jesus could show his endless patience to to me, first of all. So I'm an example of those who are going to believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king of the ages, to the immortal, invisible, and only God, may the whole honor and glory be given to him forever and always. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. God, may the words that are spoken and the reflections of our hearts be worthy of your grace, to whom all honor and glory is given, God, now and forever. Amen. When I was in first grade, I made my first communion. I went to a private Catholic school, which was run by a convent of nuns called the Sisters of Mercy, and we were supported by the Church of the Immaculate Conception. So we also had a handful of priests who lived in the rectory. The nuns ran the school, the priests ran the church. And growing up Catholic, your first communion is a pretty big deal. You couldn't receive communion without spending a lot of time preparing for it, learning about what it meant, what words would be said, how we would respond, and even how to line up and come forward and receive it. Before we could do any of that, we had to receive the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And those two sacraments went hand in hand because we were taught that we shouldn't come to the altar with unrepentant hearts and with unconfessed sin. And we do this a little differently in the Methodist Church because we believe that when Jesus Christ gave up his spirit on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn in two from the earth to heaven. And it signifies that there is no longer a need for an intermediary between us and God because Christ is that intermediary and we can pray directly to him. So we don't require anyone to have any formal training to come forward and meet Jesus in the communion meal, and we welcome all to receive it. Our traditional formal liturgy in our hymnals issues this invitation before communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. And then this leads into a prayer of confession that we say together. We haven't said it in a while. It begins, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. But in the Catholic Church, we didn't confess our sins together. We confessed them privately before the priest, either in a screened booth or face to face. We all usually lined up before the screened booths, but if the lines got too long, the nuns would usher us off to be face to face. And so we tried to be first in line. <laughs> Afterwards, after we made our confession, the priest would give us a penance. Depending on what we had confessed, the priest would tell us to go to the altar and to kneel before God and to say certain prayers, three Hail Marys, two Our Fathers, or any combination of prayers, including saying the whole rosary. And a rosary, in case you don't know, it's a set of prayer beads, and you pray through it bead by bead, and each bead signifies a different prayer. And so when I had my first communion, one of the gifts that my mother gave me was my very own set of mother of pearl rosary, rosary beads. I had always loved my mom's rosary beads, which actually had been her mom's rosary beads, but those were just these clear crystal beads with a pewter cross. These were beautiful. I loved them. They carried me through all the years, all the way up until a few days before my mom died. And I remember sitting with her in the den that we'd set up her hospital bed in. 
And I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly if we prayed out loud or if I just held the rosary and I worked through the beads just to give my fingers something to do. What I do know is that when we came home from the hospital after my mom died, I couldn't find my rosary. I tore the house apart. I went through the laundry. I went through the trash. I called the hospital. I called the medical supply company who picked up her bed. I checked everywhere, everywhere. When I moved in with my brother about a month later, I checked everywhere again. I checked every box that I packed. I checked every box that I unpacked. I opened every book. I didn't throw anything away without checking at least twice. When I moved to FSU a year and a half later, I checked everywhere again. Every box, every book, everything. And I have done this over and over and over. Every single time that I have moved, every time I go through a box of memorabilia, when I go through my mom's keepsakes, whenever I go through anything. I don't know how many pawn shops or thrift stores whose jewelry cases I've checked in the past 30 years or how many times I've looked on eBay. I'll probably be searching my whole life. That rosary wasn't expensive by any means. My mom couldn't afford much. In fact, I remember the little Cuban mom and pop bookstore that she bought those rosary beads in. It was in the same shopping center where she was a drugstore manager. But my mom bought them for me. They were with us in our last days together. So they were important to me. They were cherished. They were so incredibly loved. And that's how God feels about us. We are that important. We are that cherished. We are that loved. And if we were lost, as even I was once more lost than my precious rosary beads, God will spend the rest of our lives searching for us, calling us through the Holy Spirit and offering us abundant grace and rejoicing over us when we are found. So this week we're in the Gospel of Luke. We're in chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. And our text says, All of the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and the legal experts were grumbling, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told them this parable. Suppose someone among you had 100 sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the lost one until he finds it? And when he finds it, he's thrilled and he places it on his shoulders. And when he arrives home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, celebrate with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life than over 99 righteous folks who have no need to change their hearts and lives. Or what woman, if she owns 10 silver coins and loses one of them, won't light a lamp and sweep the house, searching her house carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Celebrate with me, because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who changes both heart and life. So if we think about this for just a moment, because it's really easy, I think, to disregard this passage and say, you know, we're not talking about anything important. I mean, first of all, we've got sheep. They're not all that bright. They don't smell all that good. And there's 99 of them who have managed not to wander away. And really, we can always get another one. So who cares about one missing sheep? You might remember, I think I've told this story before, a few years ago, our family went to Epcot. I think we only had five of our seven monkeys with us that day. And usually when we went to Disney, we would split off into groups. And this day we split off into groups of twos and threes. And two of those groups headed for Test Track. But they stopped at Club Cool to test all the different flavors of Coke from different countries. And Gary and I went to go ride the boat ride at the Land Pavilion. 
until my phone started to buzz and I answered it to hear our daughter Megan hysterically telling me that she had lost David. And she was so loud that Gary could hear her even though he wasn't on the phone with her and he just took off while I trailed behind him trying to figure out where they were and what had just happened. My heart was in my stomach and I was frantic. And it seemed like a really long time, but it probably was only minutes. And Gary happened to see David walking in the opposite direction and he reached out his long arms and he scooped David up and we all gathered together and we hugged. We were probably a little frustrated, but we did hug. <laughs> and we decided to stay together for the rest of the day. So was there a moment when I would have turned to Gary and said, you know, he's just a kid. They're not always that bright. They don't always smell too good. We have four more and there's two still at home and those didn't manage to wander away. I'm sure we could get another one. Who cares about one missing kid? Or we can say one silver coin, really? Even if it's a silver dollar, it's just a dollar, right? The woman had nine other coins. Is it really worth tearing her house apart and sweeping her house mother-in-law clean just to find one coin? It's a little ridiculous, right? But let's pretend that that amount was equal to a monthly paycheck of $2,000. And we just lost a tenth of it, so that's $200. Say our mortgage alone is at least $1,200. And every last dollar is needed for utilities and insurance and medication and for gas and for groceries. And we're on a fixed income. And there's no way to earn or borrow any more money until next month. There's no place to cut costs. We've already eliminated all of the luxuries like Netflix and Chick-fil-A. And we have a choice. We can either keep the lights on or we, can, or we don't eat. Losing that $200, that tenth, could be devastating. And our text begins with Luke telling us that all of the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to what Jesus was saying. Because Jesus has just made quite a stir. He's just told the religious establishment that their guest list have missed quite a lot of people. And those that they've missed are the very ones who are crowding around him, probably as surprised as anyone that Jesus is saying that they are invited and they are welcomed and they are overwhelmingly loved and they are desperately wanted in the kingdom of God. All of the tax collectors and the sinners, all of those on the margins, all the poor and the blind and the sick and the lame, the widows, the children, the orphans, the foreigners, all of those who are unnoticed and unwanted and uncared for and insignificant. This is a great crowd of people. So if you were one of those handful of Pharisees and scribes who were surrounded and outnumbered by this whole lot of folks that you would normally cross the street to avoid, you might be a little irritated at Jesus. And you might grumble to your friends. This fellow welcomes sinners and he even eats with them. Can you believe it? And he expects us to do the same thing. What in the world is he thinking? Last week, Gary read to us from Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you have known me. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. So Jesus already knows what they're thinking, even if he didn't hear them, as they muttered to one another, as they held their robes close to their bodies, trying to not let them touch those people who are crowding in on them. And he tells them this story about this lost sheep and this lost coin. Not because the sheep and the coin were so important, so significant, so irreplaceable to anyone else in the world, but to the one to whom they belonged. Our worth is not found in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of the one who created our inmost being, who knit us together in our mother's wombs, who knew who knows all of our days before even one of them came into being. There's a cartoon that says, leaving the 99 seems ridiculous until the one is you. I would add that going after the one seems ridiculous until it's something or someone precious to you. That one sheep 
belonged to the shepherd just as much as the other 99. That one coin belonged to the woman just as much as the other nine. So when they wandered off and they went missing, they were ridiculously missed and they were relentlessly searched for. When they were finally found, they were rejoiced over and they were celebrated. So what would it be like for us to be grumbled about as folks who welcome sinners and even eat with them? What would it be like for us to not only welcome those who have wandered off or gotten lost, but to truly rejoice over them when they are found and to celebrate? It's often said that church is not a hotel for saints, but a hospital for sinners. Linda read that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and told him, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the biggest sinner of all. Last week, we talked about what one step we could take to bring us closer to God, to move God up our ladder of priorities closer to the top. So this week, let's consider who might be someone who has wandered away or who is lost and how we might bring them one step closer to being found by God. When sheep get lost, they normally bleat, right? But when sheep get lost, they get scared and they get silent, even when the shepherd is close enough to find them. And when coins go missing, you know, they're just coins. They don't even know it. And even if they did know that they were lost, even if they could see the woman searching for them and sweeping the house, they couldn't call out to her. And there are lots of reasons why folks wander away and go missing. There's life events, there's change of relationships, there's health concerns, there's genuine questions about God. There's that prioritizing God. There's not prioritizing God at all. I know someone who, when things are going well, it's okay for God to be on the lower on the list for her, lower on her priorities. But when she hits a crisis, it's exactly where she goes. She goes right to God. I know someone else who doesn't believe in God at all. But when she hits a crisis, she goes to those of us who do believe, and she says, you know, I know you pray. So could you pray for me? So for my first, my first person, when they go right to God in a crisis, shouldn't I celebrate that that's the place that they go? Instead of grumbling that they were missing, wandered away, and they don't prioritize God the rest of the time, I celebrate because that's where she goes when she knows that she needs God. And for my friend who doesn't believe in God, when she comes to me and she says, hey, could you pray for me? I don't believe, but could you pray? I rejoice that I have an opportunity to pray for her. And I pray that there's a chink in her armor that maybe has come off a little bit. And maybe she has moved a little closer to God because of my prayers. And this isn't just a wander away from church kind of thing. Because you can worship God anywhere, honestly. Being a pastor, a lot of times when people don't come to church, when they come back, and I say, you know, I've missed you. Sometimes they get embarrassed or they give me excuses. I don't really care. I actually missed you. I'm telling you I missed you because I missed you. When we say, welcome home, it's good to be home. I pray that we mean that. I mean that. So at the very least, I would pray that we would keep our eyes open and especially our hearts open to recognizing an opportunity, not to grumble or to judge, but to invite and to welcome, not to merely tolerate, but to genuinely celebrate when folks are being found. More than me and my lost rosary beads, God is never going to give up on anyone who wanders away, goes missing or gets lost. That is part of that overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love that we sang about. That reckless love that God has for each and every last one of us. Would you pray with me? 
Gracious, loving, and merciful God, we thank you that you did not leave us missing and unfound. That even if we were still lost, that you would still be pursuing us. That even if we lose our way today, and we wander off into the wilderness, that you would never give up on any one of us. And we are so grateful, Lord. We pray that we would be as relentless with our love and with our grace for all of those who you continue to pursue and all those who are found by you and placed in our paths and in our lives so that we can celebrate them. Give us hearts to welcome and to rejoice. That is our job. Thank you, God. Amen and amen.